We want to uh, welcome you to our session on Partnering for Results. Bishop Dowling and Father Peter John have certainly laid out the challenge for our society and for this conference, and we all thank you for that. That was a great start. Um, in today's information-rich, complex, and interconnected world, uh, society is demanding more from all of her institutions. And those institutions include government, NGOs, as well as business. And in each institution, if they are to achieve their goals and serve the common good, which is the challenge of this conference, they're going to have to collaborate with other institutions. Uh, confrontation is a strategy from yesterday. Collaboration is the strategy for the future. Now, in these collaborations, um, the partnerships are among different kinds of institutions, different governance structures, different managerial attitudes, different um, managerial structures, vastly different kinds of institutions. And these institutions are clearly cross-cultural, with all of the risks and opportunities that are involved in cross-cultural discussions. We've got four speakers this morning who are uniquely qualified to, t to uh, address these, these kinds of issues. Um, Ambassador Philip Parham uh, will address the challenge from the viewpoint of government. Given the, important, the growing importance of NGOs, we've got two speakers, Hal Culbertson, and Tom Harvey. And finally, Mark Kennedy uh, will view the challenge from the business perspective. Um, so let's get right underway. Uh, Philip Parham is the Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations from the United Kingdom. He brings to us a rich and diversified experience in government service as well as in business. With 10 years as an investment banker, in the United Kingdom and in Japan, he surely understands the business point of view. In government, he has served as the head of the UK Pakistan Afghani, Afghanistan section from 1992 to 1994. He has also held appointments in Washington, in Saudi Arabia, and Iraq with a wide variety of responsibilities in these assignments. Philip also served as the UK ambassador to Tanzania. In these ways, Philip brings a wealth of experience to this topic this morning of government partnering with both private sector and civil society to promote the Millennium Development Goals. Philip. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor. It's um, a great honor to be here. I'm very grateful to Father Williams for inviting me. Uh, it's a great privilege to be in a place with the kind of ethos which Caroline Wu uh, described to us so eloquently last night. Uh, it's also quite a relief after a fairly intense uh, couple of weeks on the peace and security side of the United Nations agenda to be, to be focusing on uh, the other just as critical parts of, of the agenda. It's, it's all too easy for peace and security and the immediate demands of peace and security to squeeze out uh, the other pillars of the UN's work, uh, justice, emergency response, and relief, and prosperity in its broadest and uh, deepest sense. And uh, a university dedicated to Our Lady uh, is a very appropriate place, of course, to discuss all those interrelated pillars of UN activity, peace, justice, emergency relief, and prosperity. I reminded myself last night of the uh, ancient titles that the church gives to Our Lady in the litany in her honor, and she ticks all those boxes, uh, queen of peace, mirror of justice, health of the sick, comfort of the afflicted. And I thought I was going to have difficulty finding one that applied to prosperity, but then uh, I had forgotten that one of the titles given to her in the litany is House of Gold. Uh, although, 
although there's another title in the litany which I think may be a more appropriate model for our friends in Wall Street and the City of London, which is Virgin Most Prudent. <laughs> but I have, to be, I have to be careful about uh, uh, mixing diplomacy uh, and religion. Diplomacy and the church don't always uh, mix so well together. We, we in the UK had a foreign secretary in the 1960s called George Brown, who was rather too fond both of wine and of women. And uh, he was on an official visit to a Latin American country once and at a reception during that visit when he'd already had quite a bit to drink. Uh, he, he looked across the room and he saw this very shapely figure dressed in scarlet and uh, thought that he should investigate further. So he weaved his way across the floor and just as he reached that figure in Scarlet, the band struck up. So he thought, you know, this really was a big opportunity. And he asked the figure in Scarlet whether it would dance with him. And the figure drew itself up and replied, uh, no, I will not, for three reasons. First, because you're drunk. Second, because the band is playing the national anthem. <laughs> and third, because I'm the papal nuncio. <laughs> Right, now, I, <laughs> uh, I've been asked to give an overview from a government perspective on uh, partnering to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, so I'll do three things. Uh, first of all, set out the British government, particularly the new British coalition government's perspective on the MDGs, on the MDG summit, which was held in New York last September, uh, and on our overall approach to development. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to stress, and of course it already has been, and that's the whole purpose of, uh, of this conference, the vital role that the private sector plays in the achievement of the MDGs, uh, and give you some examples of how the UK's Department for International Development is trying to work with business to uh, realize that potential. And third, uh, I'll outline the crucial role of civil society organizations in promoting the MDGs and how uh, the UK government works with them. Uh, this conference today is taking place uh, almost exactly six months after the MDG summit that took place in New York last September. And at that summit, uh, more than 60 world leaders came together at the UN to reaffirm their commitment to the MDGs at the start of the last five-year stretch uh, before the target date for their achievement in 2015. Uh, and during the summit, uh, we, the UK, focused our efforts on securing a major push on the most off-track MDGs, particularly women's and children's health. Ban Ki-moon's Every Women, Every Child event launched a global strategy aimed at saving the lives of more than 16 million women and children. And at that event, our Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, announced that the UK's contribution to this effort would lead to saving the lives of at least 50,000 more women in pregnancy and childbirth and 250,000 more children, more newborn children, over the next five years. Uh, and note that uh, the target uh, that we announced was a target of outcomes, not a target of inputs. Uh, the event generated an unprecedented uh, $40 billion in resources for maternal and child health and convened a wide range of partners behind the global strategy. Significant commitments in action came from a number of development, uh, developed and developing countries, as well as, importantly, from the private sector, from charities, from NGOs, and from international organizations. Uh, and the UK also helped to put a focus on combating malaria by co-hosting a high-profile side event which both raised awareness and generated significant new commitments from the international community. Our Deputy Prime Minister and our Secretary of State for International Development announced our pledge uh, of as much as £500 million a year by 2014, so about three-quarters of a billion dollars a year, uh, to help halve the number of deaths caused by malaria in at least 10 African countries by 2015. And note again, the key thing was the outcome target. Uh, Nick Clegg set out in his address uh, to the UN General Assembly how seriously the UK takes its commitments 
to the developing world. Uh, and that is why we have maintained our commitment to reach the target of 0.7% of gross national income for overseas development assistance and to do so by 2013. And when we do that in 2013, we will be the first G8 country to reach that target. Uh, increasing overseas aid is, of course, not an easy thing to do in the uh, time of uh, great budget uh, and fiscal austerity uh, when UK taxpayers are feeling the pinch in relative terms at home. But our government has made very clear in terms that we will not balance our books on the backs of the world's poor and we will maintain our commitments. Uh, but contributing financially to help developing countries achieve the MDGs uh, is, of course, not merely a matter of altruism. Uh, it's also in our enlightened self-interest. Growth in the developing world means new partners with which to trade and invest and new sources of global growth. When the world is less secure, all countries within it are less secure. The MDGs are the key to lasting safety and future, poster future prosperity uh, for all of us. Given the economic challenges we face, there can be no stronger signal of the UK's commitment to the outside world. Uh, and we hope that this provides additional encouragement to other donor countries to achieve their targets. It's vital that all countries stand firm by their commitments and make more efforts to help the poorest people in the world. Now, it's important that all countries uh, live up to their development commitments. Uh, and in September, uh, those commitments were made not only by developed countries, promising more money to achieve more outcomes. They were also made by developing countries, very important policy commitments by developing countries. And what we hope is that the United Nations is going to take a lead in following up on those commitments and measuring their fulfillment uh, against the outcome document that was agreed by the 192 member states of the United Nations and against the specific commitments that were also made in side events in September. Uh, to be honest, we uh, have not yet got the kind of engagement from the UN that we want in following up those commitments and holding people to them, but we continue to press for that. Uh, it's also crucial, of course, particularly when we are maintaining aid commitments uh, against the background of uh, fiscal austerity, that we can demonstrate real results and real outcomes on the ground so that we can show taxpayers that uh, the money that is being used for overseas development assistance is achieving what we say it will achieve. Um, and that's why our Department for International Development has just completed a major root and branch review of all our bilateral aid programs and also the effectiveness of all the funding we put through multilateral organizations. And in fact, you can see uh, a link at the bottom of the DFID homepage there to the results of those reviews which were published on the 1st of March. Um, on the multilateral aid review, for example, we have classified multilateral organizations into uh, four categories, very good, good, adequate, and poor. And uh, we are stopping our funding to four of those who uh, came out in the poor category because they were failing to demonstrate that they were achieving the results we needed them to achieve. UN Habitat, UNIDO, the International Labour Organization, and the ISDR, which is on uh, disaster reduction. And there are four others in that category, the FAO, UNESCO, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the International Organization for Migration, which are on, as it were, special measures and have to demonstrate within a year that they can up their game if we are to continue our funding. So we're taking a very hard-nosed approach to achieving real results uh, from the money that we put in. And on the bilateral side, uh, we will close our uh, funding to 16 uh, countries by 2016. And we will make sure that uh, our aid, our bilateral aid, is really focused in the areas where we feel we can add value in achieving real outcomes and reducing poverty. And in particular, with a focus on fragile and conflict-affected states, to which 30% uh, of our bilateral programs will be devoted by 2014. The Millennium Development Goals cannot be achieved by government efforts alone, of course, and that's what uh, this conference is all about. All governments, both those in the developing world striving to meet the goals in their countries and those in the developed world supporting their efforts, have to work with partners outside government.
the private sector and civil society organizations uh, play a critical role in that. And at the MDG summit, world leaders agreed on the crucial role of the private sector for development and called on business everywhere to contribute to the MDGs. Private sector is the engine of economic growth, creating jobs, increasing trade, providing goods and services to the poor, generating tax revenue to fund basic public services such as health and education. And as well as stimulating growth and new thinking within the private sector uh, shaped by the market, uh, that thinking can also offer insights into how to ensure better access to vital services or goods such as medicines uh, and information. My time in Tanzania taught me uh, very clearly that uh, the key to sustainable development uh, lies with the private sector. The Tanzanian government uh, had a budget in the last year that I was there, had a total budget of $6 billion, including all the international development assistance received by Tanzania, $6 billion, US dollars, which sounds like a lot of money to you and me, but for a country of 40 million people, four times the size of the UK, a budget which is in fact 3% of the annual budget of the National Health Service in the UK to provide health, education, security, infrastructure, and so on. It's uh, obviously a drop in the ocean. And indeed, any assistance which we provide, government to government, uh, although it can make some difference, will also, in the scale of things, be a drop in, an, a drop in the ocean. Uh, and what is required is the kind of business climate which will allow a country like Tanzania to realize the economic potential that it has in minerals, in tourism, in agriculture. Uh, and yet, Tanzania actually drops down the World Bank Cost of Doing Business Index each year. Uh, and I used to talk to the Tanzanian president and say, look, here is the World Bank Cost of Doing Business Index. It provides you with a ready measure. Behind the headline score, there are a whole series of uh, individual measures for individual aspects of the business climate. What you need to do is assign each of those measures to a minister or a permanent secretary and tell them if that score is better a year from now, you will be rewarded, and if it's worse or no better a year from now, you will be penalized. Um, he thought that was a very good idea, but of course uh, it never actually got implemented. And I'm convinced that uh, business and governments uh, can work better together to convince governments like the government of Tanzania to uh, do more to improve their business environment. Because you have a, if you have an ambassador going in to talk to a president here, it's a bureaucrat here today, gone tomorrow, what does he know? But business people, of course, can speak with much greater authority. Uh, and I think we need to work better together to persuade the governments of developing countries to improve their business climates, because uh, that is ultimately the key to sustainable development. Uh, now, the, the partnership with the private sector is something which the, the new British government is particularly conscious of, and the new uh, Secretary of State for International Development, Andrew Mitchell, announced last year the establishment within his department of a, uh, a new uh, department to step up its engagement with the private sector, a private sector department within DFID. Uh, and he expressed his intention to, and I quote, recast D DFID as a government department that understands the private sector and that has at its disposal the right tools to deliver and that is equipped to support a vibrant, resilient and growing business sector in the poorest countries. And that uh, private sector department is now open and it's focused on three uh, particular objectives. One, to promote responsible and successful business. Two, to accelerate growth by creating an enabling environment for business, so what I was just talking about in Tanzania. And three, to push the boundaries of business models to generate profits and have a strong development impact. And it's working on a range of business-related issues, such as scaling up uh, business models that enhance the contribution of firms to development, public-private uh, partnerships, and fair and ethical trade. And one of uh, the things it's working on, for example, is a business innovation facility, uh, which supports companies as they develop or scale up innovative, inclusive business models. Uh, for example, uh, models which develop supply uh, and distribution chains so as to increase the participation of low-income producers, informal traders, and employees or models which develop new products and services which are needed by the poor, uh, or models which create low-carbon, 
or climate resilient business models. Uh, and they provide assistance to companies doing those things by sharing the costs of developing feasibility studies, by brokering partnerships uh, with local partners in developing countries, uh, and by sharing knowledge and learning. Um, a number of examples uh, that I saw in Tanzania of uh, businesses uh, working for development while also serving their own interests. The Mwadui Diamond Mine, where De Beers had a program of assistance to artisanal miners who worked in the area around the main mine uh, to enable them to work safely and to work more profitably and more sustainably which was in De Beers' own interest as well because that meant that uh, those artisanal miners uh, spent less time trying to get into uh, the main mine itself. Uh, Sumitomo Chemical, and I think there's a representative from Sumitomo here at this conference, uh, who gave their proprietary technology for uh, making treated bed nets, anti-malaria treated bed nets, to a company in Tanzania which set up a state-of-the-art facility uh, near Arusha to develop, to uh, manufacture those bed nets, which of course are so crucially needed in East Africa. That meant creating a local business. It meant providing those bed nets cheaper because they were locally made. Uh, and it meant uh, instituting business practices, because this really was a, is a state-of-the-art facility, business practices which could then spread out uh, wider in the private sector in Tanzania. Coca-Cola, I know Kelly is here, and he will probably talk about uh, their manual distribution centers uh, scheme, which is in Tanzania as well as other countries, um, and was one of the commitments which they made under the MDG call to business, which was launched by Gordon Brown in 2007. Uh, DFID has also developed the Food Retail Industry Challenge, uh, which encourages UK supermarkets uh, and their suppliers to source more products from poor African producers. And through that, for example, there's a supermarket uh, chain in Harrogate in Yorkshire, uh, which now source their tea from smallholder farms in Rwanda, and they're committed to purchase a million pounds sterling of tea per year, which leads to increased and more secure incomes for 17,000 poor smallholders and workers. Uh, there's a similar scheme DFID uh, has launched called the Responsible and Accountable Garment Sector, which has the fortunate acronym RAGS, challenge fund to try and help companies and other organizations improve the working conditions of uh, textile workers in developing countries. It's worth also men mentioning CDC, what used to be called the Commonwealth Development Corporation, which now operates as a fund of funds to make uh, commercial investments in developing countries, uh, and which does so very successfully. Uh, it made commitments of £2.9 billion pounds over the last six years, 75% of its investments are in low-income countries uh, and 50% in sub-Saharan Africa. And it demonstrates that, uh, and I saw it in Tanzania with uh, companies from T through to mobile phones, it demonstrates that uh, responsible investment can make respectable returns in developing countries uh, and serve the course of development in the process. Um, the UK government is proud, therefore, uh, to be a long-standing supporter of the UN Global Compact, uh, which is the largest, as you all know, the largest business organization working on responsible business in the world. Uh, Gil Kell, as I think he mentioned, was in London just last week discussing with our Department for International Development uh, and uh, confirming, or confirming with them uh, continuing support from the British government. Uh, we're also very pleased that the Global Compact is going to be leading the private sector track for the forthcoming UN conference on uh, the LDCs, which is taking place in Istanbul next month. Uh, that conference is going to provide a blueprint for international cooperation to support the development of the world's poorest countries over the next decade, so to some extent uh, taking us on and beyond uh, the MDGs. Uh, and enhancing the role of business in those countries is going to be absolutely critical. Finally, just briefly on civil society, uh, for lasting development and change, the British government clearly believes that a vibrant and active civil society is absolutely essential, and Bishop Kevin talked about this. Uh, they're vital to global partnerships to achieve 
the MDGs and public goods. And, and civil society is, of course, broader than the many NGOs that normally come immediately to mind. It includes a wide range of non-state actors, including faith and diaspora groups, community-based organizations, and so on. Uh, some are very established. Some, of course, are very small and very informal. To give a couple of uh, examples of uh, DFID participation or uh, partnership with civil society, in southern Africa, uh, we've supported making every voice count for gender equality, um, which, uh, through UK funding, made it possible for a coalition of 40 development organizations to campaign for a Southern Africa Development Community Protocol on Gender and Development, which set 28 targets for the achievement of gender equality by 2015. Another example uh, in the other hemisphere, uh, in Peru, the UK, UK support has enabled Care International to work with a local NGO, Foru Salud, to raise awareness about newborn health and maternal mortality. Around 160 women have been trained and accredited to monitor health facilities and service delivery, and citizens monitoring has helped to combat violations of user rights, such as poor treatment of indigenous women and attempts to charge for medicines which should be free. So uh, I hope at least that's touched on uh, the, the spectrum of uh, activity of the British government in support of the MDGs, uh, the fact that we see as a cohesive whole the uh, United Nations agenda, peace, justice, emergency relief, and prosperity, and that we see that it can only be achieved through partnership between governments, the UN, other international organizations, the private sector, and civil society. And it is only through that partnership uh, that we can achieve and we will achieve real outcomes for real individual people in real time. Thank you.